Amen, if you will. Turn your Bibles to Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter number 4, verse number 10. Anybody seen one of these cups before? Yeah. World's greatest dad. You don't have to worry, you found him. I got the cup. It's right here. <laughs> Well, I got to tell you, this is a cup, of course, my, my daughter got this for me a few weeks ago for Father's Day. They get excited when they find something. And uh, it's nice to have the cup, finally. And man, I don't have the t-shirt, but I'm sure it's coming. <laughs> but just having a cup that says, world's greatest dad, does that make you the world's greatest dad? No. So what makes a good dad? If you listen to the uh, government uh, announcements... You know, on the radio where they have a government-sponsored ad from the Ag Council and various radio stations take some money to, to, to sponsor one of these ads and they are uh, pushing Adopt U.S. Kids. So Adopt U.S. Kids, it teaches us that uh, you don't have to be great to be a dad, right? In fact, they, they lower the standard pretty low. I think they just want you to actually be there and not abuse the kids. As long as you pay... Uh, you know, give the kid a home and don't abuse them, that makes you a great dad, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're a moron, and that's what they kind of put out there, if you're a moron, you don't know much, you're a fool, that's all right, you're better than the dads that these kids have. Because most of these kids don't have a dad, they got abandoned. Yeah. They got abandoned, and of course, now the government is trying to fish them into homes because quite frankly... Kids that grow up constantly through foster care, bouncing from house to house to house, uh, well, we've proven it. They don't do well in life usually, emotionally, mentally, growing up in an orphanage uh, uh, type of setting that's government run. Nowhere around the world are government run orphanages uh, something that we should model child raising after in any way. There's just no models. You've got governments around the world that uh, have various programs for the children because inevitably you're going to have indigent parents, amen? But children do need a good home and they do need a father. The feminist would tell you father's not necessary. Two moms is good. Or two effeminate dads is good. But a real man, well, that's something to be shying away from, Right? And now uh, the government is looking for uh, imbeciles. <laughs> if you're a Ray Romano, forgive me, Ray. <laughs> if you're a bumbling idiot, you can be a dad. And uh, they kind of give you the idea that most of us are like that. Well, you know, it, it helps to have a good, strong dad. But a dad that uh, has some perspective. And i got to tell you, the Bible ultimately shows us who the best dad in the world is. It's God. He really is the best dad. And if you need a dad and, and you didn't have one and your uh, perhaps dad wasn't all he should have been and one day God will make you a dad. A lot of young men today, they don't want to be a dad. They're afraid. They're insecure about that fact because they didn't have a good dad and they wonder, will I be any better than him? Can I be a dad? I don't have a good example. i got to tell you, God is precious and he gives us his own example in the scripture. And if you need the ultimate example, you can look after your Heavenly Father in the Scripture. But the other beautiful thing is in Christianity, you have a lot of good models. You have some living examples of people who take the Word of God and apply it to their lives. And, and, and though they may not be perfect, you ought to be able to look at a few different men and look at what they're doing right. Amen? Amen. If you have a critical eye, you'll only see what people are doing wrong or what you think they could do better. And you'll be quick to judge and say, oh, I would never do it that way. But be open-minded. Be considerate. Look at the scripture. Compare what you see uh, in the example of a father, especially a Christian father. And look at many different Christian fathers who are living it out in their own lives. And compare it to scripture. And then imagine yourself, and this is the important part, be able to imagine yourself what you would do in that situation. Do a little role play in your own mind beforehand because practicing in your mind helps to solidify in your heart uh, what you ought to do. Amen. That's why we practice football. We practice basketball. We practice volleyball. We practice baseball. Well, some people do. 
Take baseball. <laughs> we bowl. And when you're practicing, one of the things you use is imagery. You, you use uh, the opportunity to imagine yourself doing it right, and you practice in your mind. And hope that your body functions, amen, as you see it in your mind. Well, you can do that with spiritual things as well. See yourself doing the right thing and practice doing the right thing in your mind. Take the example of others and apply it to yourself and see yourself doing things the right way. To try to purge out the things that are naturally inside of you to do the wrong way. Because if you were raised wrongly by a father, your natural inclination is to follow that behavior when you find yourself in the exact same situations. Let's look at Deuteronomy chapter number 4. Deuteronomy is uh, in the Old Testament. We've got uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and of course, Deuteronomy. First four books in the Bible. Very early on in chapter number 4, verse number 10. The world's greatest dad, our Heavenly Father, he desires godly children. And he's trusting you and me to raise some for him. So that when they grow up, they will be good children of him. Deuteronomy chapter number 4, verse number 10. My page is sticking this morning. It's like God doesn't want me in there. There we go. <laughs> Especially the day thou stoodest before the Lord thy God in Horeb, when the Lord said unto me, Gather me the people together, and I will make them hear my words. I will make them hear my words, that they may learn <coughs> to fear me all the days that they live upon the earth, and that, and that they may what? Teach their children. God bless the reading and hearing his word. Father, we pray this morning that you would give us unction from on high to be able to deliver your message this morning in grace and in clarity, Father. Help us to be obedient. Help us as men to be men of God, to be men of you, and to teach our children your ways and to guide them in your paths. That, Father, when we inevitably are pulled from the game and the game is theirs in their generation, Lord, that they will serve you with their hearts, the strength of their minds, that they will be a godly generation, Father, for we live in the midst of an ungodly generation. But, Lord, we know that here in the 21st century we are not experiencing anything new. 4,000 years ago, you sent your people among an ungodly people, an ungodly generation. Ungodliness is the natural state of man, Father, and we know that we live in the midst of of people who are in rebellion to you, Father, and who are raising their children not in the way they should go, but it's often the way they will go. And so, Father, help us to be different, for we are a called out people, a separated nation, a holy nation, called to serve and to love and to be with you, Father, that our children might raise up and be your servants, that they might love you as we love you, that we might relate our faith to you, we might give it to our children as well, that they might rise up and call you blessed as well. But Father, too often, generation after generation, children rise up and they have a half-hearted faith towards you. Father, we pray that you give faith to our children and that from generation to generation they should serve you open-heartedly. pray in Jesus' name. God desires godly children. <clears throat> In order for you to raise godly children, to pass on your faith, and to give them the law of God that they one day as adults might live by it and pass it on themselves, number one, you have to be present. Fathers, you got to be present. Absentee fatherhood does not relay your faith or your values to your children. Not the values that they ought to have. One of the things that you can do is choose carefully your bride. Amen? Yep. 
because she will make life heaven or hell for you. <laughs> she will leave you or she will keep you. How many men have left their brides and abandoned their children in our generation? As we watch society begin to fall apart, it is because fathers have abandoned their children. It may seem for good reasons. We have millions of men who have traveled thousands of miles into this country for work to supposedly give their children a better life, to give their families a better life in another country. Sometimes they have come in on a visa. We have millions that have come in by paying the Quixote money that will never hit the American tax coffers as they sneak across the border. And regardless of how much damage they do to the system, how much burden they put on the, the medical system or the justice system, you know what happens is they have abandoned many times their wives and young children in their countries. In the name of a better life, in the name of opportunity. But you know what? That check that is sent Western Union over the airwaves to a foreign country, all that wealth cannot replace the presence of a father. What kind of morality sends children on a train with pedophiles and rapists and people of ill intent, low education, to be sent to the border as small children, to be smuggled into America, and we're supposed to have compassion on this. Foolishness. So that they can have a better life. I tell you, there's no better life than having a father. You might not have much, but if you've got enough to eat, amen, and you've got a place to live and you can keep it clean, you might have a dirt, dirt, dirt floor, amen, but as long as you dust off the shelves, amen, there's honor in that. Having a father present that is there and is working and creates security and love for you. You might be a subsistent liver, but you know what? Most humans in all of human history have been subsistent livers. You cannot judge them by our standard today. Raise your children by being present. No, we have a problem in America, too, with fathers who have good jobs. <laughs> abandon their wives and they abandon their children for another woman or in this day another man and we want to call that the new normal it doesn't have to be it's the new normal because a bunch of debauched people who have already paved the way with a lot of money in the media want that to be acceptable because they want you to accept them. Mm -hmm. They abandoned their children, their first wives. When they fell into temptation and, 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 and were drawn in by these young starlets and these Hollywood producers who have the casting couch. How many young starlets have slept their way to the top over the last 80 years? With married men? How many actors give in to the temptation? How many rock stars have groupies following them everywhere? And have the generally accepted road wife. You got your wife back home and then you have your road wife, which is your mistress who follows you from town to town. While they make tons of money out six, eight, nine months a year, their children aren't with them. They abandon their children. Are they serving the country? Are they fighting a war? No, they are serving themselves. And these people with so much money control the media and they want you to accept that as the new normal because they don't want you to look down on them. I don't care how much money you have. If you do that, there's every reason to look down on you. You're ashamed because you're not a good father. A good father must be present. A good father must be present because no matter how much you say you love them or how many uh, gifts and cards and toys that you get them when you come, 
it does not replace the security that comes when the man is there. When the man is there to back up his wife, when the children are misbehaving and she's frustrated as can be, and dad steps in when that young man challenges at his, his mother and bows up on his mother, and dad is there to put the young man back in his place and to remind him that this is his mother. I appreciate having a heritage of men that have chosen to stay with their wives. Amen? My grandmother and grandfather both were abandoned by their dads back before that was popular. My grandfather and grandmother both chose each other. Grandma was 16 when she started dating Grandpa. She was 23. Shortly after she turned 18, she married that man. Her dad did not like him. What did he have to say? He was a traveling salesman who had a woman in every city because he sold groceries. He was no, almost never home. He had abandoned his family. Had mistresses galore. My grandfather, his dad, ran off with his wife's sister. Something most of the family did not forgive him for. <laughs> abandoned. <Yeah. laughs> abandoned six children. Yeah. To run off with his wife's sister. Grandpa's on it. 16 years old, Grandpa got a job and started paying the bills at the house. Brother got a job and started chipping in. Amen. The men stepped up to the plate and started chipping in. To step in where Dad didn't. When Grandma was about to lose the house, Grandpa, when Great Grandma began to lose the house, Grandpa stepped up and bought her house and worked and let her live in it. And then when his wife's mother began to lose her house, he stepped up to the place and bought her house before he even bought his own. He and Grandma decided that they were going to make it work and they were going to be married. And they were going to live and they were going to love and they were not going to do that to their children. My grandpa had three boys, all of them six foot tall and better, and Grandma is just a shorty. <laughs> Five foot four. We used to think that was short before I moved to New York. <laughs> Thought that was tiny because she had that Indian blood in her and it made her tiny. She was one of those short. She's three quarters German and a quarter Indian and she's just tiny. Got that Indian short gene, an American Indian short gene. Grandma's feisty. Did you know Grandpa? He set those boys down and he let them know. No matter, no matter how big you get, if you ever hit your mother, we're going to be in a fight. I might not win the fight, but you're going to know you were in a fight. <laughs> so you better never lay a hand on your mother. He made it clear to those boys what the pecking order was, amen? And because the man was there, the mother got respect. How many young men don't respect their mother today? I tell you why. They grow up disrespecting their mother who struggles and loves and bends over backwards and sometimes compromises way too much to try to keep his love. The love of a child, the love of a son. Because the husband is not there to back her up. And then he grows up not respecting women, but he often grows up and how many young men who were raised without a father, become womanizers. Unable to really connect and respect one woman. Often, it's as simple as dad was not there. Because if your dad loves your mom, it shows a young man how he must love his wife. When dad is there and he sees dad caressing and kissing mom casually at dinner or when they cook when they see the playfulness in the home when they see that dad may fight with mom and mom fight with dad but they reconcile <coughs> when he sees dad standing up for mom 
it tells that young man you respect women because dad is the example of how a man ought to behave as an adult. And so, through divorce, young men see their fathers every other weekend. Sometimes, if he's not busy with his new wife and new family. And that child is raised up and dad is not there to teach him how to respect mom. That child is not seeing how a man ought to behave in the home. That child is not catching his father's values. He's catching his mother's values. He sees his mother's frustrations. He sees his mother's downfalls. He sees his mother dating and bringing in men into the home and one bad judgment after another as her needy self goes and finds another man who is another loser. She wouldn't need to do that if the man who got her pregnant was still in the home raising those children. He may need to be strong with her. If she's a strong personality, there's always a, a shrew that needs tamed. <laughs> Sometimes you get a wonderful woman who has her own silent strength, and yet she needs that man present in the home. She needs that father present in the home to provide order, to keep the kids from taking advantage of her. To handle her frustrations and share the load. Man has to be present. Because an absentee father will create insecure young men who are disattached to women. At times, they'll raise homosexual men, craving and looking for the affection of the father they never got. See, God is calling men to raise your own children. Be a father. Because he wants the next generation to be godly. He wants them to catch your values. And honestly, we are to teach them and to let them see them. Fathers, God demands that you be present. <clears throat> see, wisdom and knowledge in every generation are constantly being passed down. It has to be passed down. Every child is born with a clean slate. He has an innate personality and he has a mind. He has environmental factors, but every child is a clean slate. Every child can be shaped and molded into what he needs to be. Every child has the opportunity, though he be born spiritually dead, he has the opportunity to, to know and to love his heavenly father, the creator of us all. And God has created this earth to be inhabited. What a wonderful verse that is in the Old Testament. I am the Lord, and I have created this earth, this world, to be inhabited. Don't fear global warming, or even nuclear war, or total global annihilation. However, I do <laughs> worry at times about living in a big target, <laughs> big bullseye. <coughs> But I know that this world has been created by God to be inhabited, and the Bible tells me it will be inhabited until Jesus comes. Yep. No matter what shape this world is in, when Jesus comes, the Bible says he's going to fix it. The waters of this earth during the great time of tribulation will be polluted. There will be destruction in the land. This world will be cursed for seven years. And when Jesus comes and stands upon this earth, he will send the healing waters out of Jerusalem in both directions, to the west and to the east. And he will cause the desert to bloom and the, the seas to be healed. There is nothing God cannot fix. Even that man potentially right. could destroy. Yep. This world can heal itself. It will be just fine until Jesus comes. This world will be inhabited until he comes. He has created us for his pleasure. He's created us to know him. And every generation should be taught to know him and to love him and to serve him, which is what our verse says. In Deuteronomy 4.10, he says, I want them to hear my words. I'll make them hear my words, that they may learn to fear me. Amen. All the days that they live upon the earth, teach their children. Go over just a, a chapter or two to chapter number six. 
This is critical because God wants us to train the next generation. All of us get our day in the sun and then we have our night. And then the next generation comes just as the rising of the sun. And they get their moment. And they too will have their night. Day in and day out. Generation after generation. Every generation struggles all with the survival instinct. Every generation perhaps thinks they're the last, though there will be one that will be the last. Every generation pushes for progress. Every generation strives and struggles for more. Every generation seeks glory. Our glory in this generation is the glories of technology. The next generation is going to seek the glories of biotechnology. Robot technology. Every generation is seeking some kind of utopia. I tell you, if the Father is not present, there are two competing worldviews, two completing philosophies. There is theism and atheism. There are those who seek to serve their creator, and there are those who say we have created ourselves. There are those who seek the Lord, and there are those who say there is no God. And you have to recognize that there are those two views. There are those two views that say God is our Father. And ultimately are created to love and to serve Him and to know Him. And the atheist says, no, there is no God. He is not your Father. Happenstance, chance, struggle. And the pressing for survival of the fittest, that is your Father. And therefore, because there is no God, and we as intelligent Creatures with a self-awareness, we have created government. And we who are smartest, we who are wisest, have sought power. And because we are on top and we have achieved greatness in corporate success, and we have achieved greatness in literary success, in educational success, we are the gods and we are the fathers of this world. And because they see themselves as gods and they have placed themselves in the highest ivory towers of academia, of business success and of political success, they look out on the rest of the world, the media success, by the way, as the ignorant masses that need shepherded. For they and their collective minds, they are the father of the world. And yet they don't know how deceived that they are, that they are under the influence, indeed, of who Jesus calls the father of this world. He says, you're of your father, the devil. He says, well, how do you know that? That's very offensive, Pastor. Jesus said it. Yep. He said, in the works, the works of your father you will do. That's how you know. See, so many in public service do not see themselves as serving the public, but that public is there to exist, to serve them, that they might become rich. They are serving the public and serving themselves and getting themselves rich. They can finagle it and, and work in their own minds in such a way that through intellectual gymnastics they are satisfied, but they see everybody else as too ignorant to govern their own lives. It is truly truly insulting that they think that we cannot help ourselves and that they must be there. That we cannot survive without them. And oh yes, there are so many politicians and intellectuals that sit in the ivory towers of academia who believe that we would not be able to continue without them. There's so many in corporate America who, who, who all pulling the strings in, in between the media and corporate America and the politicians and the academia. They all believe that they exist to counterbalance each other for the public good because they are gods. 
They are so wise. And this old Christianity stuff, this old world view of theism and that God is our Father, this stuff must be stamped out. First, they took the Bible out of schools, and then they took prayer. And then they began to expunge anything that was in American history that was positive in the light toward Christianity. And then, having made it absent, they began to include in our works only the things that are negative toward especially Christianity and Puritanism. So that a child is raised believing puritanical is a bad thing. If you're a prude, that is an evil, negative thing. You don't want to be a prude. And you certainly don't want to be puritanical, right? You don't want to be a puritan because they've put a negative spin on everything. Anybody who seeks to live godly or purely should be criticized and looked down on. So much effectiveness has it been as they have given us not great heroes of the faith as we looked in Bible study. They have not looked at great heroes of American warriors. No, you are raised in the assigned reading in the classroom is always anti-American. You will never read a story about an American patriot. You will never read a novel about an American patriot. No, we are assigned stories like A Tale of Two Cities about French aristocracy trading one life for another. No, you will be assigned the badge, the red badge of courage about a coward in the Civil War, hoping and wishing he could just get a little badge of courage, a little red badge of courage, so he can go home and not fight the war, and say, and you, you, you see his emotions. Red badge of courage. And when it comes to Christianity, you get two. You get the crucible which is a negative play about the Salem witch trials, and that is played up like crazy. Do you have anything positive about the Puritans? By the way, the Puritans, in the Baptists and the Congregational Puritanical people in the North, they were the abolitionists that brought the Civil War to pass. They were the abolitionists. The Episcopalians in New York City, this city altogether wanted to keep slavery as an institution. Because the Industrial Revolution had happened and they were making cloth out of that cheap cotton that they didn't have to buy from India anymore. And they could sell on the market for less in England and in France and in Europe cheaper cloth and the foundation of northern economy was built on slavery and a supply of cheap cotton. Much of the power structure in New York City and through the Northeast and Boston in New Hampshire, these people wanted to keep slavery as an institution. It was critical. No, it was the Puritans. The Puritans who did not own factories. The Puritans who were not making money hand over fist. The Puritans who sat in the fire-breathing, Bible-preaching churches under the conviction of the Holy Ghost that demanded abolition. It was the Puritans that started the Underground Railroad. Harriet Tubman, who they wanted to put on one of our bills, was a conductor, but oh, most of the freed slaves stayed in the houses of white Puritans, puritanical people, anti-worldly, anti-worldly music, anti-worldly dress, long skirt wearing, hat wearing church people, Bible thumping church people. Those are the abolitionists. Many people think, oh, the South was so religious. Why was it in the Civil War? The South wasn't very religious. Most of the South was Episcopalian. Most of the evangelism of the Bible Belt happened after the Civil War. We don't know that because you weren't taught that in history. Extremely critical to the nation's life was the conversion of the South by those Puritans and those Puritanical people. The First Baptist Church in Charleston, South Carolina was started by a Puritanical preacher from Rhode Island, Connecticut area. A soft-spoken man. The first 20 converts of this white man were slaves. 
before a, another white man was even saved and brought into the church. And did you know in the First Baptist Church of Charleston, South Carolina, that slaves and white men worship together in a southern culture under the preaching of a soft-spoken Yankee pastor? No, you don't know that. First Baptist Church in the South at all was in Charleston. You don't know that. Why? Because when you hear about Puritans, you're forced to read the Crucible and you're forced to read the Scarlet Letter. Ooh. <clears throat> and you find out that the woman wearing the Scarlet Letter who committed adultery committed adultery with the preacher. <clears throat> that is your only impression as a young child. When you're raised up reading that material like I was, what do you think about Puritans? The same thing I thought when I was 13. Puritan, bad. Those people are hypocrites. I don't want to be that. What do I want to be? I want to be whatever the world tells me. I want to be what the fathers of academia, the fathers of Hollywood, the fathers of corporate America, the fathers of Washington. What they tell me I ought to be. They're going to tell me what's good and what's noble and what's moral. No, I tell you, the only way to contradict this is through the father being present in the home and the only reason they can get away with this is because so many fathers aren't present in the home today. Why are they being so successful pushing this, this alternative morality? Children are raised without fathers. Well, you say, Pastor, I had a father. He just lived in a different place with his other wife. He wasn't there. You see, Deuteronomy 6, verse number 3, it says this, Hear ye therefore, O Israel, and observe to do it, that it may be well with thee, that ye may increase mightily as the Lord... God of thy fathers hath promised thee in the land that floweth with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one Lord. God is one. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. God the Father, speaking through the Hebrews' father, through Moses, says, love God with all your heart, soul, and mind. It takes a dad to say that to a son. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. And thou shalt teach. You got to be there to teach. You can't just leave it to the Sunday school and the church. Fathers, you are the priest of the home. Amen? And listen, for the first ten years of your child's life, You are God to your children. And if you come home every day, if you love your children every day, if you hold them to account, if you don't let them get away with wickedness, if you teach them values and you correct their nuances, you are God in the home. You represent God to them. And listen, what they will know about God and what they will feel about God and their relationship to their Heavenly Father is critical to their experience with you in the home. If you're absent from your children, they will grow up and they will have so difficult a time connecting with their Heavenly Father. Because if they felt abandoned by their earthly father, they will relate those feelings to their heavenly father, and God does not abandon you. But it is so easy to feel abandoned when you were abandoned. If your earthly father is mean, angry, they will interpret their heavenly father as constantly angry and difficult to please. If you're always trying to win their love because you went too far and compromising, they can sense that and they'll think, oh, well, God is just trying to do it. They won't respect you. And when God is kind to them, they'll interpret it as God trying to win their affection and they won't, arrest, they won't respect God. I wonder why God cannot do some things for some people is because they can't respect them. Why? Because they think 
that God is trying to win their affection just like their dad did, and they didn't respect him because he wasn't there. He didn't feel really like they were there. If you want to make your children feel loved, come home every day. Be there. Correct them, love them, hug them, play with them, tickle them, show them joy, amen? Be happy with them, vacation with them. You have to be present. Listen, when you teach your children, you can teach them directly, and you should. But the Sunday school and the Sunday preaching is not a substitute for you. From day zero to day 10, from day 10 to day 20, year 20, being in the home. You have to be there, period. And the reason is, most of your values that your children will grow up and actually apply and live. Most of your values that your children will actually grow up and apply and live. You can write this down. It's caught, not taught. Mm -hmm. Your values, the ones that your children will grow up and actually apply and live, they are caught and not taught. How they see you behave in situations is how they will behave in the same situations. They grow up and say, oh my, I sound just like my father. That was just like my dad. You're right. So dad, make sure you set the right example. You see, you have to be present But you got to provoke your children to good. Yep. You got to be present, but you got to provoke your children to good. And the way to do that is to set the example in the home. The way you love your wife is often the way your son will know how to love his wife. And there's just no substitute for that. If they grow up without you, if they grow up without a father, if they grow up with a bad example, they will grow up insecure because in their mind they won't have a picture of what they should do. That is why I encourage you at the beginning of the sermon, young men, if you do not have a good example of a father or don't have a father at all, you need to adopt a dad. You say, but I'm all grown up. I mean, adopt a dad who's doing it right. <laughs> and adopt several dads and look at how they're doing it and say, I can see myself doing that, can I? How are you going to be a better father? By following your father, your own dad's example? Or by following the example of godly men following the example of the father? The ultimate father, our father God. Your goal ultimately is to teach them to love God with all your heart and soul and mind, with all your strength. If you do that, your children will love him. If you love God with all your heart and soul and mind, your children will learn that your children will pick up your spirituality. If they don't, they have to work extra hard to create their own spirituality. They will have to stumble through the dark and find their own way. And unless they're personally driven, they will be easily swayed and, and, and swept along in the natural world. Listen, if you're not their father, television will be. Media will be. Government will be. Corporate America will tell them what to believe. The school system and academia will tell them what their values should be, how they should interact with one another, how they ought to live and believe. Oh my goodness. We've created chaos in this situation, and I want to tell you, men, be a man. You don't have to be super strong. Maybe you're built of slight build, amen. But be a man. Have strong character. Have, have the strength of your convictions. Have a, a, a deep, strong faith. Be kind. Show them kindness. Show them how a man ought to be. Have rules inside of you. Know when to fight and know when to give in. Show them how to sacrifice and survive. Ultimately, we see Jesus Christ showing us how to sacrifice and revive. 
See, you've got to provoke your children to good. Ephesians 6, 4 says not to provoke. It says, fathers, provoke not your children to wrath. Don't be bothered by your children. Don't be <clears throat> an indigent father where you take out all your frustrations on your children. If you're an absentee father, you're provoking your children to wrath. Even you don't do anything to them, the very fact that you won't do neither good nor bad to them because you're not present, you're provoking them to wrath. When you put illegitimate feelings in your children, you engender insecurities into your children. When you tear your children down and don't build them up, you're provoking them to wrath. Because a child that grows up as a man insecure is frustrated. And there is a simmering and a boiling and it will explode in different areas. You're provoking your children to wrath. Don't be so strict with your children that you can't give them leeway and understanding. You say, well, God is holy. That's right. God is holy. And look how much he puts up with you before he punishes Follow your Heavenly Father's example. Hold the line, but correct behavior. Don't just get even with them. Don't teach them revenge as a policy. It's not a Christian policy, and that's not how our Heavenly Father treats us who belong to Him. God will revenge righteousness upon the unbelievers. Revenge is what God does to the unsaved. To those who are His children who are born again and belong to Him, when we bear his name and we're his children, he treats us differently. God does not revenge himself on us. Jesus already took God's revenge upon himself. God corrects his children. Fathers, learn to correct your children, to provoke them to good and not to wrath. Because if you're always only correcting your children in a negative way, and you don't share with them love, if you're just mean and you only say something when they're doing something wrong, if you don't tell them when they're doing a good job, you're liable to provoke your son to wrath. You're liable to provoke your daughter to wrath. Fathers got to be there to love their daughters, amen? amen? When your daughter turns 18 years old and she starts looking around for a potential mate, you say, 18, that's kind of young. It's not too young to look for a mate, begin looking for a mate. Some of you, 30 years old, 35, 40, you can't find your mate. Why? Because you had no father. You had a bad father. 18 years old, when a woman is a young woman and she begins to look for a mate. Fathers, live your life in such a way that you want someone just like you. Poor young man, if you're a really good father in this day, he's going to have trouble living up to your standard. The preacher's actually going to have to tell her, be careful, don't judge him by your father's example. He's had 20 years of experience. <laughs> your father, your dad, your husband is not your dad. He's a, your dad is a good man, but you're going to have to be patient with this guy. He's a fixer-upper. <laughs> He's got a lot to learn. Oh, that every single Christian man would live in such a way in the home that he would raise his daughter and his son, that his son would want to be like him, and that his daughter would want to marry a man like him. If you've done that, you've done something to create real security in that child. She knows her place and she knows what she wants. He knows his place and he knows what he wants. Lastly, men, I say this because in this day, if you're not a father, the government will be. Amen. And now the government is tired of being a father. You know why? It's running out of money. That's why they're running the ads on Adopt Children U.S. Go with me to 1 Timothy chapter number 5. This is our last verse, and I'm going to look at this quickly. Women provide for the family, and you read uh, a lot of things in Proverbs chapter 31 that a woman provides for her family, but it's not a woman's job to provide for the family. Got me? It is second best. Do you hear me? It is second best when the mother is the breadwinner. 
and it's not God's provision. It's not God's purpose. The mother provides so much for the home. She provides her own security in the home. She provides so much learning, and she comply, provides compassion. There should be some nurturing, amen? And some of these lesbians and feminists who say, well, I'm not a nurturing person, and I don't want children. Well, praise the Lord, you're not a Christian. I don't want you to have children either. <laughs> I could care less. They say, well, women should be in combat. A great volunteer. They're going to have a draft eventually, so <laughs> sign up now. We'll get you on the front lines. If that's the nature of the woman, she doesn't have a nurturing bone in her body or a motherly instinct, well, amen. I want you in uniform. <laughs> There's always a war coming around the corner. We want you up there. And, man, I tell you what, we put together a squad of ladies during PMS. They all sync up. <laughs> I tell you, Vladimir Putin, we run and scared in his boots. <laughs> ISIS, oh, man, can you imagine those guys? They'd be running for the hills. <laughs> The feminist squad. <laughs> They're all PMSing. They'll be in trouble now. We'll win that war. But, you know, the natural state of women is, is a certain nurturing. He said, oh, pastor, that's sexist. Yeah, okay. It's funny, Barbara just had a baby. It's a wonderful thing to have a baby. We're very thankful. The baby came safe. Mother and child seem to be safe. It's preemie. You know what's fantastic is how a woman who's had a baby before and she's breastfed, the child, if she's in an environment where she hears a newborn crying, you know what happens sometimes? <laughs> That's right, she begins the lactate. She's not pregnant. She could be years away from having had a child. And a woman can hear, literally hear, a child cry that's not even her baby. And she can begin to lactate. She has a physical reaction to an emotional thing. It's instinct. You can't tell me men and women are, are the same. I don't know, maybe some of these men who are raised on this Prozac and stuff and they got those, uh, they got the need for one of those man bras. Maybe it'll happen to him, but that's not natural. But it happens quite often with women. Because it's a natural state of men. Men and women, we are physically different. We are mentally different. A young man, literally in the womb, when his body begins to change, and because of his Y chromosome, and every child with a Y chromosome is a boy, regardless of what his environment tells him he is or how confused he is at 8, 10, 12, 14, 18 years old. He is a man. He is a boy child. And in the womb, chemicals go off to change him into a boy so that on the sonogram they say, congratulations, missus, you're having a boy. The same chemicals that change that boy from a nothing into a boy as opposed to becoming a girl, that Y chromosome, those chemicals also cause brain damage in the right hemisphere of the brain. The right hemisphere of the brain is where the emotions are centered and aspects of the emotional experience are centered there. And as a result, every male child has brain damage. And it is a brain damage that stays for life. It's an interesting feature of physiology. Because as a result of it, the left side of the brain, which is more logic-centered, is left undamaged. And the emotional side of the brain takes years and years to have some recovery, which is one of the reasons why you tell an 8-year-old, oh, no, there's going to be a war, a 10, 12-year-old boy... Man, there could be a war. Oh, cool! Is there going to be nuclear? Are there going to be bombs? And that 10, 12-year-old child, you go, how can he be so uncompassionate? Don't you teach him to love? Yes, you teach him to love. And it will take another 30 years for him to actually feel deep compassion for someone else's problems. Brain damage. It's nature. However, a girl child... 
does not have this brain damage. Both hemispheres of her brain function properly. You might say a woman is in her right mind. <laughs> but what it does as a consequence of having both hemispheres of her brain fully functioning and having not one side lopsided of another, but she has her logic functioning and she has her emotions functioning. The problem is those two compete without one overriding the other quite often, which is one of the reasons that men and women are different. And though it can create uh, things in a woman where a woman feels instinctively, we call it woman's intuition. Mm. She feels things, but she can't always understand the logical part of her brain, can't put always the pieces in together, but she knows something's not right. You see this in a marriage with a husband and a wife, and the two of them are in a situation, and the man and his wife are in a social situation at a party, and another woman is coming on to her man, and he is totally oblivious to it. He doesn't see it, not at all. <laughs> and she says to him in the car on the way home, you know she was coming on to you. Mm -hmm. No, she wasn't. Oh, yes, she was. Is she jealous? She knows. Why? Because she sees the signals. She feels them. She knows the mind of another woman and the man. He's just happy-go-lucky like a puppy. <coughs> Doesn't have a clue in the world sometimes. And she's there to say, oh, watch out. I don't like her. Oh, sometimes she'll say, you know what? There's something not right about it. I think there's something not right. Her, her intentions are right. Or that man's got other intentions. The man's like, oh, no, you're just misinterpreting. You don't know. Uh, it, it's going to be fine because he's, he's sticking with his logic. He's sticking what he can, he can see, right? He's got his five senses telling him one thing. But I tell you, men, the Bible says respect your wives because she might not always be able to articulate what it is she thinks and feels, but she is there to compliment you. He made you the head of the family, but she is there to see what you don't see. <laughs> Many a man have stumbled into trouble. Because he was not willing to take his wife's advice under advisement. In fact, so much so that Peter, the great bull of the New Testament, says, Husbands, you got to love your wives. He says, respect your wives. He says, listen to your wives, lest your prayers be hindered. He's speaking to men. He's not speaking to women. Listen to your wives. You know, he's not looking at the 21st century. It says, because if you don't respect your wife, you're not careful. God gave you her for a reason more than procreation. She is there for a counterbalance because she's got her full brain. And she'll see things you don't. She'll feel things you don't. She'll consider things you don't. Listen to what she has to say, even sometimes it's not pleasant. Same time, people at different times can become irrational because... The full function of her emotional side of her brain is working. When her hormones begin changing, it can cause emotional ups and downs. It can cause her to go a little far in extreme and, oh, he said this. I can't believe that preacher said this. Good thing her husband's there to calm her down. It's okay. It's not the end of the world. <laughs> it's nice when her husband's there to say, it's not what you thought he said. Oh, but I thought he said, no, it wasn't. That's not what he said. Men and women are there to be a balance. But it is not the job of the woman to provide for the home. Most cases, God gave the man the broader shoulders to carry the heavier weight and the burden of the day. Look at 1 Timothy chapter number 5, verse number 8. If any provide not for his own, not her own, it's the natural inclination for a woman to apply, supply for the family, which is why the courts, in a sexist manner, give the children to the wife in a divorce. You say it doesn't seem fair in a world where everything's supposed to be 50-50. Well, because even in this, this latent sexism of our modern day, we see the courts still have enough to understand the natural state of a woman is to care for the children. And if it was 
the other way that the man would always provide as he should and not just get for himself and go on and conquer another woman and start a new family and do his own thing, the court would not have to sequester half of his paycheck. If they really believed that he would just give it on his own. Listen, real Christian men don't divorce their wives easily, do they? And yet, you have so many people divorcing their wives easily. Real Christian men have a duty and obligation to their family. Real Christian men know what this verse says when it says, any man, if any, doesn't provide for his own, especially for his own house, he hath defied the faith. You want to be the world's greatest dad? Get a job. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Keep a job. Yeah. Hold a job. Struggle. Maybe it's not what you want. Okay, take something, but you have an obligation to Provide the home. First and foremost, God will not hold your wife accountable for her job in providing for the home. She may have to if she doesn't feel secure in you. If she doesn't believe you are going to do it, she'll often go out and get a job. But if she believes that you'll do it, you, you, you can create an environment where she's free. If she wants to stay home with the kids, she can. So, oh, but it's so hard. I know. You say, Pastor, what you're saying is so out of touch with the world. I know. Thus, the atheist worldview, the theistic Christian view. You say, Pastor, are you telling the truth? Are you just such a sexist? That you... It's not that I'm a sexist. Listen, I put my life where my mouth is. And my mouth is where my faith is. And my faith is in this book. My wife does stay home with the kids. You say, well, oh, Pastor, is it because you're such a sexist? No, you know, I was raised to believe that if a woman didn't work outside of the home, she was lazy and you should think bad about her. Mm -hmm. That's how I felt. I became a Christian. I still felt that way because it was so deeply ingrained that if, if a woman didn't work, there was, she was lazy and you should feel negative about her because you can't respect somebody who won't work. That's what the culture taught me. You know what the Bible taught me? I got under some real conviction after I got married. Because I had to start struggling with the idea of, well, God wants me to have children, but my wife, she's, she's got this job, and she's progressing, and now she's working in Midtown, and it's wonderful, and I'm having all this money. is great, because the more she makes, the more I can spend, the more cool things we can have. Right? Isn't that the real reason most men want their wives to go to work? So that they can have more to spend on new cars, newer cars, have a boat, new toys, go to movies whenever they want, have the deluxe cable package. We can afford the $200 cable package and not the uh, basic cable. Isn't that really... got Ladies, I'm going to tell you the truth. That's why men want you to go to work. That's why they want you to go to work. They want more stuff for themselves. Sorry, you're thinking, oh, this is so equal and, and the reason they're, they're letting you go... They, they know you feel insecure. Well, what if I leave? What if he leaves me? i got to have my own job and career. Wow. If you feel that way about a man, you need to keep looking. He's not the right man. Keep looking. If you don't feel secure that your husband's going to hold a job and help supply for you because he loves you and he has a responsibility, if he's not Christian enough to believe what this says, that if you have not supplied even for your own house, you've denied the faith, if he doesn't have that conviction, you're with the wrong man. Oh, but I love him. Find another one. You'll love him too. I'm sorry. I'm telling you the truth. It's a principle. You're going to end up struggling in life, and when you guys are fighting every day because you're coming home tired after 12 hours of work and you're being flirted with with the other men in your office because you're good looking, and he's being flirted with the ladies and he's got nothing to come home to because when he comes home, he's fighting with you. You tell me how happy you are and how much you love him when you're on the verge of divorce. So, oh, Pastor, that doesn't always happen. Are we really going to go down that road? <laughs> Look around. It, it's the new normal. I put my life where my, my mouth, where my life is. I struggle. Because I had to overcome feelings that was put into me by television. Feelings that were put into me at school. Feelings that were assaulted me because I had to overcome. If my wife wanted to stay home with the kids, I literally had to overcome my feelings. I had to pray about it because I, I had to repent. I'd say, God, I know these feelings are from you. I know where they're from. 
And God, I've been saved for years, and yet these feelings are still inside of me. And I should not feel this way. She is not lazy if she wants to stay home and raise the kids. Right. Mm -hmm. God, it is my responsibility to supply for the home, and I know that. It's clear. His house, supply, provide. Your job to put the roof over their heads. Your job to put food in their mouths. Your job to put clothes on them. You might not be able to afford much. It might be your wife's job to sew the patch on. Yeah. <laughs> You guys work together, at least you're poor together. Yep. All right. But if you're not coming home stressed every day, if you're coming home stressed every day and the house is clean and the kids are happy and your wife is happy and you're stressed out that you can't have more stuff, well, you got a spiritual problem. And I don't say that lightly. you got a spiritual problem that you, you want more stuff and you can't have it and then you're going to come home unhappy and take it out on your wife and kids because you can't have everything that these people have because they force their wives to work. And yes, if your wife works for a period of time, you can have more stuff until the government finds out you have more money. And if they find out you can get by and they can take more of your two incomes and they can take more of that and you can still get by, guess what? They will. Guess what? They will. And guess what's happened over the last 50 years? As women have entered the workforce, have taxes gone up or down. Mm. Yeah. You realize that when women began entering the worst force in the 1950s, there was no income tax to speak of. There were almost no taxes in the entire culture. You realize that? Almost no taxes. But as women went to work, in the 1960s exploded into the 70s, and in the 80s, 50% of women were working in the 70s, and now they want, if couples, almost they want, they would love it if 100% of women and men in every family were working, and yet somehow they expect you to have a peaceful, happy home where you're not divorcing and the children are not being left into the system, and now they're griping because there's so much trouble in the culture. And they're always trying to roll with it. And now they say American kids are lazy and self-entitled. And they're so sensitivity and trained that you can't say anything to them. And so corporations are buying not just to make money. They want people from overseas who are still tough. Yeah. <laughs> and not complaining and self-entitled. And they're bringing them and shipping them in as much, fast as they can. Bringing in immigrants from overseas so that they can have tough people. Or whiny. Everything has consequences. We have to have a father in the home. It's your job to supply. Ladies, find a man who meets God's criteria. Fathers, you want to be the world's greatest dad? You have to be present. You have to provoke your children to good. And praise the Lord, you have a responsibility. You've got to provide be present, provoke to good, provide. It's all about our heads, close our eyes, so no one looking around. I know this was a painful sermon. Oh, that there were a million sermons preached across this country this morning that sounded just like it. We'd have revival. I know I've given you a lot of things to chew on. I know I've rubbed the cat. Grab the cat by the tail and stroke its fur backwards, especially if you've been indoctrinated with the world's view of what's right and what's fair and what's good and what's equal. You say, Pastor, are you saying the whole world should be like this? Listen, I'm not, I'm not naive. Most of this world doesn't love Jesus Christ. They, there's an enormous amount of insecurity. Quite frankly, sin and sinful choices have, have created a conundrum in our society not my job to fix the world. It's only my job to deliver God's word to God's people and you guys got to struggle with it yourself. What I'm saying is so contrary to what you're going to hear today on the TV from politicians who are mealy mouth, politically correct, just trying to get votes. It's definitely not what you're going to hear in academia. So pastor, should you say it if all those people aren't going to Aren't gonna, if all these wise of the world, if they're going to say something different, should you, Pastor, just go with the flow? I tell you, if you go with the flow, we'll have a much bigger church. If I never touch any of this stuff, church will be much bigger. 
will we be creating godly disciples? Is it really good in a culture that the devil and his crowd in their greed is the only voice and there's no counter voice? There's no counter perspective? You can take what I say, you can leave what I say, it's, it's between you and God. You say, oh, pastor, you're just old-fashioned, wishy-washy, washed up. That's why you don't have anything in church. Okay. You can prayerfully consider what I've said, too. You can temper it with your own perspective. I don't expect a lot of converts this morning. It's a tough pill to swallow, especially if you have a financial need. It could be you're in a situation where you don't have any other option. You have to, the ladies have to work and but husbands, I, I'm speaking to men that are here under the sound of my voice. Your father, put your wife in a position that she doesn't have to. Be a provider. Be present with your kids. You, your wife may choose to, to both work outside of the home, but be wise. Don't think you're going to escape all the pitfalls that 100 million other Americans are suffering with every day. Overworked schedules, burden, tired all the time, sagginess, just unhappiness frustration and tired living for the weekend. When the weekend comes, you're overwhelmed taking the kids this way and that way and the two of you, your husband and wife, you grow apart and then wonder why you don't love each other anymore when you were so in love before. You couldn't live without each other. 100 million couples across the country facing the same thing. How many women in their mid-40s finally just bite their lip and say, well, I just got to have something. I'll put up with this. This is the new normal. It doesn't get any better. I've had so many relationships. Nothing's different. At least this guy is nice. Maybe he's not. This guy might not be nice, but at least he's got a job. Everybody in our culture eventually settles for second best. That's the way it seems to push, but I tell you this morning, I'm presenting you what God says is first best. Perhaps during this invitation, men, if you don't have the father or don't have a father that was the best example to you, maybe you can pray about it. Say, God, help. It starts with a simple prayer, God. You are my heavenly father. Help me to learn from you. Help me to apply these things to my life that I might be a good father. I can't be accountable for what everybody in the world does. But God, this morning, I recognize that I am accountable for what I do. I'm accountable for the choices in my life. Jesus, forgive me. Jesus, help me to become the man that I need to be. I really want to be a good father. I want to be a good husband. I want my children to have better than I was given. All that a million sermons across the country were challenging men this morning. I've got six. Let's all stand to sing our final hymn of invitation.